Good evening, everybody. I'd like to welcome everyone out to our Southeast Region RAC meeting for 6.30 p.m. We're actually meeting kind of a hybrid this time, but it's good to be back in person for those of us who are here. Um, for all of the, the members that are here, you have a new microphone in front of you. It's, it's lit up red around the base. If you want to speak, just push the button, turn it green, you can speak. Push the button, turn it red, mutes it again. Um, those who are attending virtually, just hit your button to raise your hand and we'll, we'll see that and we'll acknowledge you and then you can speak at that time if that works for you. Um, first thing, um, I guess we'll go through, we have four new RAC members this time. So what we'll do is we'll go through and we'll just start around the room and we'll have everybody introduce themselves, say, tell who you're representing and just a, a brief overview, you know, just a few seconds about yourself. So we'll go ahead and start down at this end. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead and start. I'm Steve Duke uh, from Monticello. I represent the sportsmen. I've um, been on the rats for two years. Um, Justin Ivins. Anyway, I'm new to this game. I um, represent agriculture, a ranch down in San Juan County, south of Blanding. And Anyway, that's my game. Scoop Flannery, I've been here for two years. Joe Sacco out of Helper, Utah. Uh, I'm representing agriculture, I guess. And uh, we run a herd of cattle and farming that up that way. We have Kent Johnson, uh, at-large representative, uh, vice chair of the RAC. Currently, I'll be conducting tonight. I've been on the RAC for six years now. Eric Luke from Farron, Utah. Uh, I'm a sportsman's rep. Been on the RAC for four years. Darren Olson uh, with the Forest Service with the Manti LaSalle National Forest and been on the rack for three years. I'm Sunshine Brosey. I'm from Price, Utah, and I'm a professor at USU Eastern, and I'm representing non-consumptive, and this is my first rack meeting. Okay, those of you online, go ahead and introduce yourselves. One at a time, we'll start with Kirk. Go ahead. Uh, my name is Kirk Player. I live in Cleveland, uh, so in Emory County, and I represent Sportsman. Been on the rack for four years. Okay, go ahead, Todd. My name is Todd Thorne um, from Price, and I represent at large. And Dana. Hi, yes, I'm Dana Truman, and I represent the Bureau of Land Management. I've been on the rack for, I think, three or three and a half years, and it's very nice to meet all you guys, and sorry we're virtual. Thank you. Hey, did Lynn get on yet? No, not yet. Okay. Yeah, we have one more that should be attending soon virtually. It'd be Lynn Sitterud, and he is uh, public elected official representative from Emory County. Okay, we'll move on with our agenda and we'll have the minutes, the approval of the agenda and the minutes from the previous meeting. And do you have those pulled up by any chance, Chris? I, minutes, I don't. I, have I, the... I don't have the minutes pulled up right now. Um, was there any question on that? Did anybody read the minutes from the last meeting? and have any questions about that. If there's no questions, um, I would entertain a motion. I'll make a motion that we uh, approve the agenda in the minutes as noted. Second. Okay, we have a motion by Eric Luke and a second by Darren Olson. All in favor? Any opposed? That appears to have passed unanimously. Next, we have the wildlife board meeting update. And I did not attend that board meeting. I believe Chris did. So could you do that update for us, Chris? Yeah, 
Yeah, actually, I think Guy Wallace attended for us, if I remember correctly. But um, I'll give an update. Um, if you remember, if you remember, it was about waterfowl, and one of the hot topics was whether we should allow guiding on waterfowl management areas, land that's owned by the Division of Wildlife, um, and that generated quite a bit of discussion. It was a survey that went out that um, was discussed quite a bit. Um, the board made a few motions. Um, in the end, they passed a motion and it passed unanimously. It was a motion that said uh, that the division establish a special use permit for guided waterfowl hunting on waterfowl management areas for the 2021 season. And that guides who guide on these WMAs in Utah would need to apply for that permit. So um, that's what's happening um this year um and there was quite a bit of discussion in our southeastern region rack about a special use permit so um other racks had discussed that as well so that that discussion gains the momentum and the and the wildlife board ended up passing that um they also passed a motion unanimously that a working group be formed to establish rules and regulations and licensing for waterfowl guides in the state of utah so that's gonna happen. Um, and then the other remainder of the recommendations pa passed as presented. Um, conservation tag allocations passed as presented and uh, the board accepted the CWMU committee as presented. And then the board also approved the Parker Sage Grouse hunt closure as presented. So that's all I got. Okay. Uh, one other thing I forgot to mention in the introduction is that at the end of this meeting, it's not on the agenda, but after our final agenda item, we will be electing a new RAC chair and vice chair. So we'll be thinking of who you want to nominate and vote for in that process. And we'll take care of that after we take care of the Cougar recommendations. And now we'll move on to our regional update, and that's Chris Wood, our regional supervisor. Good morning, or good evening. <laughs> good evening. Um, glad you're all here. Welcome to our new RAC members. Um, thanks for volunteering and being part of our Regional Advisory Council for our region. Um, we appreciate your service and the people who you represent. Let me just update you real quick on what we're doing in our region. Um, our habitat section is um, and I assume everyone can see my PowerPoint presentation. Is that right? Okay, good. Um, our habitat section, our biologists are working with the BLM and um, with uh, law enforcement to address some trespass cat cattle situations in the region. Uh, we're also working with our partners, the BLM and the Utah Wild Sheep Foundation to fund a seasonal who will check guzzlers in Grand and San Juan counties. This is a program we've been doing for a decade or two at least now. Um, we have a lot of guzzlers in our region because it's such a dry region and the BLM and our partners, our sportsman partners have been very generous in donating uh, money and time and material um, and in-kind costs to make sure these guzzlers are operating and functional and have water in them. And so um, this will continue to work on that effort with them and it looks like they're, they, they, they enjoy the partnership too and they see value in it. So we look forward to that. Um, our, our biologists are also working with private landowners in the, in the region, especially those who are affected by the, any of the wildfires that have happened. Um, there's funding available for them to uh, reclaim some and seed some of the land that got burned. Our outreach sections has several events planned for the next few months. Um, the, a new fun one we're having this Friday night in Moab is our reptile and amphibian night. Uh, if you're interested in attending that, you can go to eventbrite.com, search by the Moab location or our agency, and you can sign up for that event. You do need to sign up for that event. I think there's still a few spots left, but uh, it's the first time we've done this event. It'll be really fun. We're, um, we have some expert um, rep reptile and amphibian biologists in our region. Um, Scott Gibson, who's our non-game biologist, is one of them. He did his master's degree on rattlesnakes. Um, Aaron Bott, our outreach manager, he's really good with, with, with reptiles and amphibians as well. And so those two and a few others in our agency are hosting this event. And they're actually going to have live snakes and lizards and amphibians and such to show the 
the group. So it, it'll be hands-on, maybe not hands-on, but it'll be uh, in person. You'll be able to see these, the animals that live in our area. Um, in September, we're planning a waterfowl clinic for the youth. And then, and also in September, we'll be having a fly fishing clinic. So uh, more information about that will be coming out. Law enforcement is always busy. Uh, this, this time of year, they're, they're doing checkpoints at Bullfrog to um, find any boaters who are driving past the ramp and not obeying the AIS laws out there. Um, and we're educating lots of people about too about quagga mussels and, and what that means for them and their boats and trying to prevent the spread of quagga mussels throughout the state. Um, water's low throughout this, the state. Uh, from my understanding, Bullfrog, um, the ramps at Bullfrog, some of them are, are out of the water. Uh, they're working on extending that north ramp. I think there is one ramp at Bullfrog that's still accessible. Does anybody know if that's right or not? I'm not sure. Okay. Anyways, water levels are, are really low throughout the state. Wherever you go, you should probably check whether that body of water is accessible or not with the boat ramp. Um, our wildlife biologists, they are just finished up um, mountain goat classifications or surveys on the LaSalle's. Uh, they're also doing elk classifications and bison classifications. Uh, they did elk classifications in July. They're supposed to do bison classifications on the Henry Mountains uh, today and tomorrow. The chopper broke down, so it looks like we're going to need to get that fixed, and we'll be out there next week instead of today and tomorrow. Um, our biologists are also doing bat surveys and compiling kit fox and bird set survey data. Looks like uh, the elk surveys that we did, as you can see on this slide, um, even though that we are in a severe drought, calf production this year is about normal on most units. Uh, bison calf production is down a little bit, not quite as low as it was in 2018 though. Our aquatic section, I've been working on the LaSalle's. There's um, a native cutthroat trout species on the LaSalle's. It's uh, um, the Colorado cutthroat, but it, we, we're looking to expand that and enhance the habitat on the LaSalle's for that fish. And so in order to do that, we took some fish from that population and we took it to our hatchery where we'll grow fish um, in the upcoming years, be able to restock that area after we do some habitat treatments and some enhancements in that area. So that's exciting. We've been working, that's been in the works for years now. And it was good to uh, finally get those fish moved to a hatchery and start that conservation work. Um, the mammoth boat ramp is out of water. As I mentioned earlier, there's a lot of boat ramps out of water. And uh, jo Joe's Valley, I haven't heard the latest, but as of like a week or two ago, they expected that ramp to be gone. Is it done? It's closed now. Okay. So I guess shoreline fishing only at Joe's Valley. Um, Monticello Lake, uh, because of the drought conditions, we increased the limit there to eight. Um, and then lastly, on the Matheson Wetland Preserve, we had some success this year. We did a big project on the Wetland Preserve uh, just north of Moab uh, to try to help uh, the native razorback sucker. Um, that project was successful. We found larva in uh, the, the wetland, which means the idea to bring in water and, and, and fish into that, the wetland, raise some larva, and then flush it out. Into, this, into the Colorado is working. And so uh, the project worked and will continue to work for years. So that was exciting to see this first year uh, that it worked. And with that, I'll take any questions you have and Guy Wallace is here too to answer any questions also. No questions? Okay. What? Kevin has a question. I have a, a comment. Okay, Come, Kevin Albrecht. Um, I last week I had the opportunity to go to the Wafa meetings and they actually talked about some new technology. You were talking about the, the guzzlers and Arizona and Nevada have now on many of their really remote guzzlers deplo deployed a satellite sensor that can go on the guzzler with a little um, solar panel pack and a battery pack and it can tell them when the water level um, reaches a certain point. And so some of our real remote, remote areas, maybe that'll be very helpful, but they, they lost some sheep in both of those states. Um, the guzzlers um, dried up quicker than they thought, so they were able to, um, they said the conservation districts would be able to help you find that little um, pack. They use them for many of their ditches and stuff. So anyway, I thought I'd share that. Thanks, Kevin. We'll take that back to our habitat section. 
That's great information to know. Anything else? Okay, thank you. Okay, thanks, Chris. Um, we'll move on to our next agenda items. Will be fur bear and bobcat harvest recommendations. And as we do this, the kind of the order we'll do this, we'll, we'll look at our recommendations and then we will go to questions from the rack, questions from the audience. And then Chris will go over the, the survey results online that we had. And then we will go to comments from the audience and then comments from the rack. And any of you that are here, comments, you want to get them brought up right now, give them to Chris, because once we start the comment period, we're not going to accept any more comments. And so if you have any comments, fill out the form back there and bring them up to Chris. And with that, we'll turn the time over to Darren DuBlois. He's a mammals coordinator. Hopefully uh, everybody had an opportunity to look at the presentation. So um, I'm happy to take questions on, on the fur bear recommendations. I had one question. Um, do, you, do you know what the numbers are when removing the cap? How, how many tags, how many more tags are sold? It's a good point. I, I can look it up for you. I, I don't know off the top of my head, but um, I think I've got some data here, if, if you'll bear with me. I just got to go back a couple years and see where, we're, where we were. Oh, okay. Maybe, except I'm not online. <laughs> so we're going to have to improvise. I'll look that up. Any other questions on it while, while I'm doing that? Oh, yeah, Dana. Yeah, I just had a question. I didn't know if you could just elaborate a little bit more. Um, Oh, wow. It's now telling me I have to lower my hand. Okay. Um, <laughs> I know, computers. Because um, I, I do understand that two of the measures uh, for bobcat populations, you know, are met. And so therefore, Division of Wildlife, you know, can, you know, add permits and add a week. But um, it kind of, it says, you know, it may. And so I was wondering if you could elaborate on, on why you're making the changes and like how healthy is the population. Typically with bobcats, the we have a baseline uh, management strategy. So we'll have a, a baseline season date length, a baseline permits per individual, and then and generally no cap. That's that's baseline for bobcats. Usually the drivers of our bobcat population are, are not is, is not going to be trapping. It's going to be things like small mammal population fluctuations, and bobcats tend to kind of follow those. And so what we're trying to do with the management plan is is be sensitive to those. When, when when populations appear to be going down and, and then we make some reductions. So the metrics in the plan are intended to try to detect that. Um, so the plan's quite prescriptive. Um, it it, it kind of says do this, you know, when this happens. And so we, we feel like with the juveniles and the harvest number and, and, and an uptick in, in, other, in those other, and, and then the one that's still outside of the parameters is right there on the on the cusp. So our default would be just to go back to baseline, and obviously we'll keep an eye on it. If it looks like thing, you know, the drought I'm sure can affect it. The uh, the the hemorrhagic disease that we're seeing in, in rabbits is another thing that we'll be watching. But we tend to, I, I think baseline tends to be a fairly conservative um, allowance for for the ability to take bobcats. And so uh, we feel like we're we're safe to go to baseline when when we can. We like to, to be there if we can. Is that okay. yes? And then you you hit on the other two questions I had. Oh great! About drought and the hemorrhagic disease. So it sounds like you guys are monitoring things. So thank you. We're, we're keeping an eye. One more question, uh, Darren. Can you elaborate? I, I believe the general understanding is that this cap is removing the cap is something new but that's not the case is it it's typically yeah i mean we uh, 
very had a cap for a very short time. Right. Yeah, it's just been the last couple of years. So our default, um, I'm trying to remember when this plan went into effect. I want to say 2015, the new one, the, the current plan. And and from the beginning, there were no there was no cap. We did we did remove or we, we placed a cap on two years ago, and it looks like things are, are looking a little bit better in the Bobcat world. COVID may have played into a little bit, and the other thing that really affects Bobcat harvest is pelt price. And so when pelt price is high, we tend to get an increase in harvest as people uh, take advantage of, of that. And then as pelt prices decline, uh, we see declines too. So. Um, yeah, does that help? Okay. I'm still looking for, I, I, I got online, so we should be good here in a second. I'm still looking for where, where we've been in the past. I had a question. Yes. Um, is your population data based just on harvest data or do you have road kill data? It is. Data? Yeah. So it's a chi-square estimator on, on, on harvest. So, um, that, that's kind of the best we have right now. Um, we've had some discussions in some of the other racks about maybe the, the timeliness of, of looking at that Bobcat plan again, maybe here. I mentioned that there seem to be some other drivers. Um, I'm also interested personally in, in maybe looking at, you know, with camera trap technology and some of the new research in, in those fields, we might be able to tap into some trends and use something like that. But that's kind of where we're what we're thinking. But right now, that's we use the best available data we have. Yeah, and I'm just a little concerned about making d two different changes when you know we have an unprecedented drought occurring yeah. and all these other diseases of lagomorphs and things. So. I understand. Any other questions from the rack? We can go to questions from the audience. Anybody that's here, if you got a question, go ahead and come up to the mic and ask your question. This is, again, question period only. If you have questions, points of clarification or something, go ahead with that. If you have a comment, wait till the comment section. So I did find permits. Um, the It looks like the average uh, permits sold without a cap is somewhere uh, between you know, 8,000 and 8,800 is kind of the peak within the last, within recent memory. Um, 1819 was, was 8,076. So, and that will change depending on pelt price quite a bit, but that's, that's probably a good, I think the high, historic high um, would have been back in the early 2000s. We were seeing 10, 11,000 permits sold. And, and what is the cap set at? It, it, we set it at 80% of the of the previous year's sales, and it was 6,500-ish. It was less than that. It was like 64-something. And so uh, um, the potential, you know, if we look at recent history, is, is to, to potentially see a, a couple okay, thousand I, more. I was just curious what that difference was. Yeah. Thank you for that. Yeah, sure thing. Any questions from the audience? Um, you want to go through the online survey, Chris? Yeah. We had three people fill out our online survey for our region. 100% um, of them strongly disagreed with the recommendation. Uh, there was one comment um, that was concerned about potential over-harvest, over and they recommended that Bobcat number permits be reduced to two. Um, they also recommended that any out-of-state trappers be required to purchase a permit for any trapping in Utah whatsoever. Thanks, Chris. Um, comments from the audience? And did, did you have any comment cards up? One. One. Okay. Okay, if you've got comments, uh, bring them now. Trappers Association wanted to make a comment. They filled out. Okay, so Ronnie Hunt. Okay, Ronnie Hunt. Uh, Ronnie Hunt, president of the Utah Trappers Association. Uh, thanks to the members of the RAC. Appreciate your time and for the opportunity to comment here. We have got a couple of proposals that we'd like to uh, 
to recommend. The first one is concerning uh, non-resident license licenses. And uh, the way it is now, uh, non-residents are not required to have a license to trap non-protected species, and that's basically coyotes, red fox, muskrats, and coons. So say if uh, a non-resident comes to Utah to trap coyotes and he happens to catch a badger, which is protected, he would be in violation if he didn't have a, a fur bear license. So uh, our neighboring states all require non-residents to have a license to trap in their state and we feel like it makes uh, more sense to require that here in Utah and that uh, it would save uh, save them being in violation if they did happen to catch a non or uh, catch a protected species and we would recommend that this uh, does not pertain to non-resident coyote hunters and the other change that we propose is uh, there are several areas in the state that are, have been closed to beaver trapping for years and years. And a lot of these waterways are in Summit, uh, Cache, and Rich counties. And these areas have experienced a lot of damage over the years in the way of flooding and, and property damage, trees and timber. And we feel like open, opening up some of these areas uh, for harvesting of beaver maybe on a draw or some sort of a limited take method, and that would allow for a more uh, manageable population of beavers, and it would uh, lessen the damage. And the last thing is uh, we do support the Bobcat management plan and the recommendations that, uh, that the division have recommended, and uh, we would be in support of no cap, with the reasoning behind that is if uh, you put a cap on the tags that it allows for those tags to be bought up by uh, people who have no intention of uh, hunting or trapping or harvesting a bobcat and it takes away opportunity from sportsmen and trappers so that's my proposals and comments and thank you for your time any any questions <clears throat> Go ahead, Eric. Turn your mic on. Turn your mic on, Eric. Um, just to clarify on your your uh, recommendation for the areas up in in northern Utah, are you proposing to open those areas only for beaver trapping, or uh, for all trapping? Well, they're most they're closed for beaver and mink, so it's it's mostly just the waterways. It's not closed to uh, okay. land trapping. Mostly just the waterways. So. Okay, thank you. Yep. Thank you. Hey, I can see Darren wants to speak to that a little bit. Um, typically when, when we close areas, it, it is just for usually just for beaver trapping. We're trying to either establish a, a population in an area or a drainage where we've got some concerns, usually habitat concerns of trying to reestablish re riparian areas. Um, but Ronnie's right. Some of these some of these areas stay closed for a long time, and and they're what we've traditionally done when we had uh, problems, you know, conflicts, you know, flooding roads, those kinds of things. Is is contact a trapper that we know and have them come in. Um, we wouldn't be opposed to establishing some some sort of system that uh, it, it wouldn't be a public draw like we do with big game. But I, I think at a regional level. Uh, similar to a depredation pool, I think we could probably talk about doing something like that. The idea would be rather than just open the area, especially if we had concerns about over trapping, um, we could we could draw a name out of a hat and allow a trapper to go in and take a set number uh, or or to deal with a specific problem. Uh, so so we're not a, we're not opposed to that. We'll just need to work with our regions to uh, to figure out a system. But that that'd be my recommendation if we wanted to do something like that. Um, that, that's really all I have. The out of state uh, permit thing, I, it's um, it's tricky. Currently, you know, we're, we're a little different than a lot of the states in that coyotes coyotes don't fall under the jurisdiction of the Division of Wildlife Resources in in Utah. And I'm sure some of you, especially those of you, who have been on the racks for a while. Remember, we brought trapping rule around a couple of years ago, probably four years ago. So currently, if you want to trap in Utah, you're required to have a tra trapping license, which which identifies your traps. 
And if you take a non-target species, as long as you're complying with all the rules, um, you have some immunity from, from prosecution. Requiring a license to take coyotes it probably falls outside of the board's authority just because coyotes don't fall under Division of Wildlife Management. So that's a little more tricky, but obviously uh, if the RAC wants to have a discussion and make some recommendations, they're not opposed to that. But just, just kind of FYI, it's, it's a little more sticky than it would be. And other states, coyotes are fall under their game departments, and so they have a little bit more leeway. I guess what about the red fox? Because they they they'd fall under our jurisdiction. A, so yeah, yeah, and they're they're not. You don't have to have a license for those. So right. Yeah. So how would that work? I mean, can you do one without the other? The board the board can enact uh, rules that address species that fall under their authority. So um, and, and to be honest, I'm I'm not sure exactly how that looks. You know, we need to we need to maybe flesh things out but i'd encourage the rack to go ahead and have a discussion and if you feel like making a motion let's let's do that and then in the in the interim between now and the board we could certainly get into it a little deeper with with folks in salt lake do those non-resident trappers have to have the same trap number and identification yeah, they, they do have to have a license in order, in order to put a trap in the ground and let, with very few exceptions you've got to have a license and, and identify your traps yeah i figured that but i want to clarify Hey, you can correct me if I'm wrong, Chris, Darren, or Guy, or anybody. Um, I believe we're like raccoon and coyote and jackrabbit, I think, are all regulated under the Department of Agriculture in the state of Utah. So it would probably require an act of the legislature to be able to actually do that because the legislature would have to move those species, raccoon and coyote, into the Division of Wildlife's purview and away from the Department of Agriculture. Is, is that correct or in my assumption on that, Darren? That's my understanding. So um, in order for the board to require any, a license to take those animals, they would need to be under our under the, the board's authority and, and currently they're not. So that would that would require a legislative change. Okay, do we have any other comments from the audience? None. Comments from the rack. I guess I'll make a comment. I, I do like the idea of the proposal for opening these areas because if there's if there's a problem area and we're calling in specialized trapper, we're taking away opportunity from from the you know general trapping public so uh, I, I think it would be uh, a, a good thing to set some sort of a system up when where that can happen and the, the opportunity can be provided to the public for that so any other comments from the rack If we have no other comments, um, we'd entertain motions. Um, if you want to make a separate motion to that effect, Eric, your comment, then go ahead. Yeah, uh, I'll make a motion that we ask the division to set some sort of a system up that provides an opportunity for the public to be able to trap in those areas uh, whether it be on a limited basis or whatever that looks like that can sustain, the areas can sustain. But we look at uh, setting up a system that provides that opportunity to the public. I'll second that motion. Okay, we have a motion by Eric and a second by Scoot. Um, go through that motion again. You want? Did you type it up there? Yeah. Just go ahead and yeah. read that and make sure we got it right. If you can improve it, let me know. But what I have is that you've, you made a motion to ask the division to set up a system that provides an opportunity to trap in those areas. <laughs> okay, that's the Reader's Digest condensed. Does everyone understand what that means? <laughs> that, 
that covers it and he's got it typed up. So we have a motion and a second. Any other discussion on the motion? Just one question. When yes. you say set up in those areas, you might want to try and define those areas. That's just a comment. I agree. Yeah, that's a good idea. Make um, You want to amend your motion to, to specify the areas, Eric? Yeah, and, and I don't know the, uh, I'm not familiar with all of those areas. So Darren, Darren can you help me out here? I think for purposes of the motion, I, I think close, areas close to beaver trapping when when trapping opportunities become available to, to allow the general trapping public an opportunity. Maybe that's. Okay, well, let's try this again. Uh, make a motion that the division look at setting up a system to allow uh, public trapping in the areas and the waterways that are currently closed to beaver trapping. That sound all right? My second's still good on that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I have a comment. Yeah, go ahead. Um, I just, it seems kind of counterintuitive that DWR spends a lot of time trying to build the beaver dam analogs and then we're trying to remove beavers from these areas. And we understand the ecosystem services that beavers provide, and we don't have good numbers on beaver populations. And so I just think that we, it's too preliminary to be thinking about a trapping season for a species that we don't have good data for. Okay, thank you. Any other discussion on the motion? Yeah, I, I guess if I could get, maybe I missed it. So these areas are closed because why? What's the reasoning for closing those areas? <clears throat> there could be various reasons, but typically it's to try to, usually it's to try to recover a riparian area that, that's, that's been degraded somehow. So, you know, beaver activity can, can raise water levels, for example. So you have a really undercut system. Um, having some beaver dams in that system tends to spread water out and collect sediment and, and bring the, the stream itself back up. In most of the cases I can think of, it's something along those lines. And my understanding of what, what the Trappers Association is asking for is that if, if we needed to go into an area to address a problem, that, that the public would have some opportunity to do that. Um, in my mind, that would that may or may not be the case. They're, they're, we, uh, a region may not want to allow trapping. Perhaps they're trying to set up a, a brooding area so that the beavers in that area are protected and then can, can uh, so it, it would depend on the management goals of, of the region. Um, but uh, but I'm, I'm comfortable setting up a system if we needed to have a trapper address a problem that, that we could do that. Um, a little bit more equitably perhaps than, than we have in the past so i'm not sure the current motion is in line with the the trappers association recommendation am i wrong or right I, i'm kind of i'm a little bit confused on the motion too if it's, uh, if it's to, to open it completely then no but if it's to put it out to draw you know then I think, yes so i guess could, i'm not sure on that let me see if i got your motion correct eric um your motion, what you're wanting to do is if the division identifies a problem somewhere where there's beaver or it's close to trapping in the waterways for beaver, that you would prefer that there be some system in place where public trappers could be contacted and allowed to go in to remove a set number of beavers as opposed to just calling in somebody, somebody professional, government trapper, whoever. Is that what you're trying to get at? Yeah, I mean, I'm not suggesting, and and I want to clarify with the Trappers Association too to make sure that we're, you know, that I'm understanding exactly what they want. But I'm not a, I'm not looking to just say we're opening everything up. But if there is if there's a problem area and beaver need to be taken out, I would like to see that opportunity go to the public rather than just a, a hired trapper. Okay. Does that cover your recommendation? Yeah, I think that's pretty close. Our concern was just, you know, there's areas in there that roads have been flooded and 
we get a lot of calls from private property owners. They've had, you know, trees cut down and, and uh, you know, lost, you know, their property there that way and trees and timber. And we thought, uh, you know, rather than somebody just moving in there and taking it upon themselves, matters into their own hands and taking these beaver or if it went through uh, animal damage or whatever, if, uh, you know, there was a hot spot where there was a, overpopulation of beaver if we could have some sort of uh, uh, limited take method where a trapper could go in there and then take the over uh, abundance of that population and and help out uh, that way is what what we're proposing so okay thanks so does my current <coughs> motion cover that do what, I need to amend it what again? we'd like to do if you would, I mean, it's totally up to you, you know, but would you consider rescinding your motion and making a new one so it's a little clearer? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> we'll try this again. Third time's a charm, right? So I rescind the uh, earlier motion uh, and make a new motion that the division look at setting up a system that allows the public trapper to participate in harvest of beaver that uh, uh, in areas where there is a problem and not just hire it out. I know Chris can say it better than me, but. I, I got it, you got it. Got it, okay, we have a motion on the floor, a second. Second. Who seconded it? Who was the second? Okay. Did you get that? Okay. All right. Do we have any discussion on the new motion? I just have a question. Is is it true that sometimes these nuisance beavers are relocated to areas where the populations are um, limited? Hasn't hasn't that occurred with DWR in the past? Certainly, yeah. And that'd be a consideration as well. And and we have uh, we've talked to the Trappers Association in the past, and, and have gotten some some buy-in from them as well to to uh, to do live trapping, and have had members of the trappers. So we we certainly have had those discussions. I think I think what the trappers are asking for is um, some way for for perhaps the the public at large when lethal methods need to be employed to to have a way to to get an opportunity. I, I don't have any concerns about that and I think certainly I understand the motion what you're asking for us to look at any further discussion or questions on the motion so just to clarify this would not be live trapping though right this one or yeah this would probably include lethal trapping lethal trapping okay just checking we have a motion in a second. But I guess it? one comment on that would be that it doesn't remove live trapping as an option. It's still there. They just have the option to put those out to draw when they deem necessary. Any other questions or discussion? It will go to vote on the motion. All in favor? We have six in favor, all opposed online. We have all, all three on. Um, yeah. What do you What do you want us to do? Do you want us, because I we can raise our hand and you can see us. Yeah, that works. Okay. So Kirk, Todd, and I all raised our hand. Oh, and Lynn. Okay, so four online voted in favor. We, and then we had six here in favor. Any opposed? We have two opposed, motion carries. Okay, do we have any other motions on the remainder of the division's recommendations for Furber and Bobcat? Yes, that's where we're at right now. I've I'd like to make a motion to um, 
adopt the division's proposal as as it's been stated. Okay, we have, we have Steve Duke with a, a a motion to approve the remainder of the division's forbearer recommendations. A second. I'll second that one. We have second by Scoot. Any discussion on the motion? Okay, if no discussion, all in favor? We have it's 10 to 2. We have 10 in favor, it looks like, or 11. We have 11 in favor. Any opposed? And we have one opposed. Uh, motion carries. Okay, we will move on to Cougar recommendations. And we'll turn the time over to Darren. Um, if it's all right with the, the chair, I, I, I've noticed, so we've been through a few RAC meetings so far, and, and I feel like there might be a little bit of confusion, not confusion, but may, maybe some uh, unclarity about how, how uh, our... Uh, predator management plans work. I think it might aid with our discussion tonight if I could just briefly kind of cover that again. I, th I think in the presentation we did a pretty good job of, of describing how how the, the legislation affects and how, how the process works, but, but maybe getting a little bit more detail about how a unit might go in would be helpful, but obviously it's up to the right. I think that would be a good idea if nobody okay. has any objections. Okay. Um, we have, uh, as a result of, of legislation that, that the, uh, the legislature passed a, a year ago, um, the director has been uh, been directed to act immediately whenever we see uh, ungulate populations, and generally we're talking about mule deer here, but that are failing to meet uh, harvest objectives with, with one caveat, and that is that predators can be shown uh, to potentially be contributing to that that problem and so there really are um, we needed to write a policy in order to to give our biologist direction on how to how to make that decision and uh, that policy came around last year and was approved by the board and so just really quick um, there really are two main reasons why we would recommend a unit for mule deer um, for predator management in order to benefit mule deer herds. One is fairly obvious, and that is if we have cause-specific mortality that indicates high levels of cougar predation on, especially adult female deer, um, but also, you know, it could be fawns if our fawn survival is really low and, and we see high predation. And it could be other predators as well, you know, things like black bears and, and coyotes as, as well. Um, but tonight we're talking uh, uh, cougars. The other situation might be where um, we see a, a, a short-term um, catastrophic loss in those population numbers, drought being obvious right now to all of us, but it could be hard winter, where those mule deer populations or, or prey populations fall quite a ways below what the carrying capacity of the range, what the habitat can support. And, and what we see in the, in the literature is if predators ever exert some downward pressure, that that's typically one of the scenarios that has to be uh, in the case. And so the strategy here is when you see a significant decline in prey numbers, you tend to maintain kind of status quo with your predator numbers for at least some period of time before they would naturally fall off. The objective on those units would be to try to reduce that Pop, that predator density over a shorter period of time and then let both populations uh, come back together. So those would be the two scenarios uh, that most of our predator management plan units are in. Now this is a director's action and, and the reason it is is because the legislature said it had to be done immediately and so um, a lot of times we can't wait a year. Uh, the director needs to take action and so that's that's how units get in. Another question that's come up, and it'll come up again tonight as part of our discussion, is well, when do you when do you take a unit out of predator management? A lot of times that's tied specifically to 
to the metrics we looked at to get it in. So if we saw an improvement in, in uh, cause specific mortality, Manti is a good example. Um, we were we were seeing about, correct me if I'm wrong, guy, it was like 72% adult deer survival uh, does on the Manti over, over a, I don't know, the last four or five years. And, uh, but we were also seeing deer in December that were in really pretty good body condition, which would indicate the habitat wasn't limiting. Um, but we saw 20%, 30% loss to mountain lion, 30% uh, cause specific mortality to mountain lions. So in active predator management, we're only one in, year in, but we've already seen that, uh, that uh, cause specific, or yeah, cause specific mortality drop off. And now we're seeing 97% adult doe survival and, and a, a big reduction in, in, in cougar specific mortality. So, so those are the kinds of things that a district biologist, biologist will be looking at. Um, again, you know, one, one year is probably not enough time to know if that's a trend or if, if it's an anomaly. Um, usually we're looking at probably a three year time frame to, to have these plans in place and then see where we are. But um, the other thing we did in the policy on purpose was to put up some sideboards and create some scenarios. Um, but we tried not to be really specific about particular triggers just because unit by unit from unit to unit things can vary quite a bit. We really have put um, a lot of authority at the level of our district biologists on these these plans, they're the people that are on the ground. They understand the resource at a local level. They understand the people that are involved and the concerns that they have. And so we really are relying on our district uh, folks to, to do that. So I just wanna kind of give an overview. Hopefully that'll help us with our discussion tonight. Obviously, if anyone has questions about particular units, if they're within the region, we'll have Guy address those, but, but I'd be happy to, to get into those as well. The only other thing I wanted to add before we start with questions is um, we did catch a little bit of a, a, a error on our presentation on the um, limit on dogs on the LaSalle's, the, the Book Cliffs East and, and uh, the San Juan Mountains. We overlapped by a day on, on when dogs were allowed and not allowed. So that should be the 13th of April, if I remember right. I have my slides up instead of the 14th. I'll double check the date. We just need to correct that. Just make sure everybody's aware of what we're, that would be our proposal. So if you adopt our recommendations, that would be in there. And that's just to correct a, a, an error that we made when we were adjusting those dates. Other than that, I'm happy to take any questions. Okay, any questions from the rack? Go ahead, Eric. Uh, Couple of questions, uh, Darren. I, I know one of the comments that we received through the uh, online thing uh, stated legislation that was happened earlier. That uh, I'm paraphrasing here, but basically said that the division had to uh, maintain a healthy mountain lion right. population. Correct me if I'm wrong, but this new legislation, if I understand it right, would would trump that old legislate legislation. Is is that correct, or is I that? I think so. Two things. We still have the objective of maintaining uh, a population of cougars in Utah, and and I think one of the reasons that we're seeing the situation as it unfolds right now is is primarily due to drought conditions. Um, though, and and some heavy winters we've had recently. You know, we. It looks like uh, mule deer uh, numbers probably peaked three years ago, and, and then we've seen some some weather-related pro not problems, but but causes for those populations to decline. Um, but we also have really good cause-specific data now that we never had before with new te technology, and we've got a lot of deer and elk on the air with GPS collars. Um, BYU is running that study. Um, they're they're going afield whenever they detect an animal's dead, and determining what what the cause was. And we we just haven't had, been able to have that kind of data. Studies have been done, but generally it's VHF and 
a lot of times you don't know that it's dead until probably a week after every time that collar moves it thinks that the animal's alive and so if it's being preyed on and, and dragged around and jostled you know you don't know it's dead until maybe three or four days after it's dead and then by the time you get there it's difficult sometimes to tell uh, what what killed it and what scavenged it and we have now we've got these collars that that really can get us out there uh, short time and, and a lot of our biologists have have not have yeah encountered the predator <laughs> at the kill site so uh so so that's really good data it really helps our biologists make make decisions about those about those things yeah one more question uh I think it it's good if you could maybe elaborate just a little bit, but there's there's 53 cougar units, right? right? Mm -hmm. 33 of those are in predator management, right. which basically takes all control out of the rack and the wildlife board hands right. through the legislation. And so basically all we're going to vote on tonight is the other 20 is that right that right. Accurate? so those 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 under predator management have been enacted by the director already under that new legislative authority um and that's that's what the director is required to do so tonight as far as action items go would be the other 20 units um that we're that we're talking about tonight um that doesn't preclude discussion um i'm sure the board would be interested in 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 any thoughts that the racks have along those lines but but yes if if units in predator management that's a director action that's already occurred and and to take him out of that would be a three-year average is that what you said or legislation right i mean i'm just general rule of thumb is you know we, we did a, some research on the monroe um, probably about a decade ago and it looked like it took about three years of, of high quotas to, to start to see a decline um, but we review we review these plans twice a year, e even when they're under predator management. So we look at it in the summer um, after the winter and, and see where we are with, with with deer numbers. We look at it again in December, usually right after um, we've done body condition scores. So we have some idea of how 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 they're going into winter, and at any time during that, a, a biologist could recommend to 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 come out of it. But realistically, um, one year probably isn't enough. You need to sustain um, that harvest over a period of time. And then it'll take a little bit of time to kind of get back to the equilibrium after we come out of a plan. So, so we'd need to expect to give uh, those animals a little bit of time to, to sort of stabilize. We know that cougar populations, um, you know, they have hierarchies and territories and, and things like that and that gets disrupted to a certain extent when you're when you're taking a lot of animals out of an area any other questions i'm just curious um if you sold a lot of spot and stock tags like the numbers and and if you have any data on yeah. success with that we did so um we, we sold just over a thousand spot and stock permits like it was like 1024 i think and um my recollection is seven people harvested on those tags we expected that to be really low success um there are a lot of states in the west that, that don't allow the use of dogs and their success rates are a little higher than that probably 10 percent. so we may see a learning curve on those but again we, we expected spot and stock to be it's tough i mean obviously it's fairly clear I think a lot of people are motivated by, uh, well, I'll have one in my pocket and, you know, maybe I'll, I'll see one. So that's, I think, I don't think anybody went into it thinking it was a guaranteed thing, at least people who are familiar with hunting and how many times they've seen a mountain lion in the wild. So. Any other questions from Iraq? Questions from the audience? Brett Guyman, um, do you have the the cause specific mortality for this year on the on the Manti and the San Juan study? I'll let, I'll let Guy answer that. I don't know if he's got it or not. No, 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 no. This year I have for 
last year for 19. Does that start in December? Yes. Yeah, it's December to de December to December is what that is. But do you, if you have that, I got you one for last year. No, I know for last year. Oh, okay. I can. Well, basically, I wanted to, to kind of show how, how much of a difference that's made. That's kind of the intent. Okay. I think. Uh, I think BYU just came out with some data, and, and I don't think all of our all of our managers have seen it yet. I, and I haven't seen it. I've just just heard that they they yeah, just all finished. All I saw was the actual survival numbers. Right. Right. So yeah, but but it you know it it, it changed. Yeah. For sure. Any other questions from yes. the audience? With with that change being as drastic, so the number I heard was one um, since December um, from Randy. But uh, I know we have to give it some time. But we, uh, say for instance on the Ron Rose study, we had a limited harvest. Um, when you're seeing those trends, now we have unlimited harvest, and so that kind of compl or that multiplies kind of that. You know, cougars, for those of you who may not know, don't have offspring every year. It's other year, every other year. And so for a cougar population to rebound, it takes a, little, a significant amount of time. Um, and so would that influence your decision on whether or not to go to less than that year and say maybe leave it in for two years rather than three? I should probably let Guy answer this question too, because really it'll be up to the region. But um, but but yeah, we'll look at uh, we'll look at the data and make a determination. It, the other thing to bear in mind is some of these units have had fairly high quotas before we went to to a predator management plan, and we we take all that into account. But Guy, you can speak for the Manti specifically. Uh, probably the only thing I can add to that is, is with well, even on the man type, most units we see annual variation in in the harvest level or uh, in those mortality factors, and so you know it'll go up one year, go down the next year, and so I think we would want to look at it over a longer term uh, rather than just base our decision on a one year change. So that's probably the best answer I can give to that question. Any other questions from the audience? Cody Webster. Um, which would have priority, deer or sheep, for predator management? Because you, you got to pick. Um, there are different criteria for different species. So if, if uh, sheep and, and uh, deer coincided, the difficulty with sheep is that, that a small number of lions can do a lot of damage over a short period of time just because of the nature of our sheep populations and, and how and the numbers. And so uh, so that's obviously a concern. You can get one male or, or, a, or a female with kittens into a sheep herd and they can do a lot of damage in a short amount of time. Having said that, we can certainly work with partners like Wildlife Services to address some of those concerns. Um, Right now, you know, we, we're really concerned about mule deer numbers, especially given what's going on in the landscape with drought. And, and, and uh, so I don't know if I can answer, you know, I guess the answer is it depends on the unit and, and it really depends on what the local biologists' um, priorities would be. So um, if you've got a specific unit, um, we could certainly address that on that one. You want that now or to the comment? By comment. Unless you have a question about that particular Any other questions from the audience? I'll move to comments from the audience. Um, looks like Ronnie Hunt left, so. Yeah, go ahead and do your review of okay. the online comments. Okay. Just a reminder, um, our, re our RAC members received these comments and the results of our survey several days several days ago after the comment period closed. So I'm just reiter reiterating something you've already seen and, and, and read. But uh, like I mentioned, we had three people fill out our online survey um, for cougars, 
two people strongly disagreed and one person strongly agreed. So um, to summarize a few of the comments, one person said there are too many cougars in the Manti and uh, we need to keep hunting them. Um, another person expressed um, their opposition for the, for the legislation that was passed last year by the legislature. Um, they believe it doesn't allow DWR to manage for healthy cougar populations. And then a third person had a pretty long comment, um, you've all read hopefully, um, that went over several different um, aspects of, of the recommendations that you've, you've, you've seen. Um, one was to not allow any collar cougars to be harvested. Um, one, one addressed the Beaver East unit specifically, and then um, they wanted us, to, wanted DWR to consider the, the ecosystem services that cougars provide um, to the environment, so. Hey, thanks, Chris. Um, comments from the audience, looks like Ronnie Hunt has left. Oh, Brett Guyman. Comments? Yes, for comments. Uh, Brett Guyman, this is representing the Utah Housing Association. Uh, I think all of you got the email uh, with the attachment um, outlining the um, the proposals, proposals that we had, so I won't go uh, into the specifics, but I'm going to go um, hit all of them. First of all, uh, the Housing Association asked for the removal of the public lands verbiage in Rule um, R657-20. Uh, 10-21. Basically, it's um, allowing uh, depredating cougars to be taken. Um, what we would like to see is to have um, that just happen on private property and to include language to exclude um, public lands from that. Uh, second, uh, that no collared collars uh, within the boundaries of the six designated BYU study units um, through the end of the Cougar Management Plan, which ends in 2025, be taken, with the exception of spot stock. And that, those units are not currently in predator management. So um, there is a color study going on in on the Mantis. Um, we've got colored cats there. We're not asking for those colors not to be or those cats not to be taken. It's just specific. These are units that don't that don't currently fall under. Uh, predator management. Um, it takes a lot of time and effort um, from not only uh, division personnel but houndsmen. It's expensive to to collar these cats, uh, and then you know when they get killed, that's that's you know disrupts that that data flow that the division tries to use to kind of establish a baseline on on cougar activity to get a, a kind of a broader understanding of of cougar behavior. Um, number three, uh, not to add the Beaver East predator management designation. Um, essentially, uh, Beaver East, uh, let me get the numbers here. So Darren talked uh, specifically about the, the Manti going in. You know, we had a, we had a high lambda score um, indicating that we had healthy deer going into, into winter, we had healthy deer coming out of winter, we had fairly high lion predation, and so um, they put that unit into predator management. Um, you know, unlimited in, in my opinion may have been a little extreme, but that's where, that's where we ended. Um, beaver is a different story. Um, two years ago, beaver went in as the second lowest condition um, for, their, for their deer going into winter. Um, their fawn survival, they've got, essentially they've got deer dying of malnutrition, fawns as well as does. They do have lion predation, um, but by the, the division's terms, um, we would consider that, we, we interpret that as being compensatory, not additive. In other words, those deer, those deer are going to die anyway. Um, so I don't think, personally, I don't think a, an increase on that unit um, is unjustified, but I think going unlimited um, is a little extreme when you have underlying um, conditions other than predators that are um, factoring into the deer survival there. Um, so that's the beaver. So basically, I would I would hope uh, for a motion to, um, you know, some type of language, perhaps for a for an increase in tags, but but not unlimited. Um, 
Number four, establish and publish clear criteria for when a, a unit enters predator management um, and when it's removed from predator management. I think Darren hit on that a little bit. Um, number five, move certain units from harvest objective into uh, split season structure. Um, essentially what that's going to do, we think, is uh, force hunters um, in a, into a particular area and kind of you know, focus the harvest where uh, the division is, is thinking that the harvest needs to be. Um, and I believe that's it. Um, in addition, um, Eric brought up the fact that there's so many units. I'm, I'm going back to Beaver. Right now, um, if you look in the proclamation, there's 27 units that are unlimited. There's 15 units that are under harvest objective, and there's only 13 units um, that are limited entry, uh, which means us as houndsmen are a little bit running out of lions where, or, or places where we can go find a lion to train our dogs and, and uh, catch cat on. Um, so just another plug for hopefully removing the beaver out of that uh, predator management, or not, not necessarily predator management, but unlimited um, status. So thank you for your time. Thank you for your service. And uh, we thank the division for, uh, for working with us. Thanks. Cody Webster. So my question regarding the deer and sheep is we've got almost zero harvest on sheep units. That's because almost the entire state is wide open. In my mind, a sheep is way more fragile than a deer. I mean, we have a lot less of them. There's a lot more money in them. I think if we really need to decide what we're gonna prioritize, if we need to take care of the sheep, we can't have everything wide open. Um, for instance, the rattlesnake unit right here, zero cats killed. For the last 10 years, almost no cats killed. It's because people can go elsewhere. There's no reason to hunt those harder places with fewer cats. Um, I, I would also like to see the book cliffs removed from predator management. We're seven years into the slaughter there. I don't know anybody that knows anything about the book cliffs that could say the deer or the elk or almost anything but wild horses is doing better than it was seven years ago. I don't think the lions are the main problem. So maybe it's time until we get serious about taking care of the real problems, Let's not just keep throwing it on the lines. We got to do something about the horses and the wild cows and the spike hunt and the ridiculous amount of cow hunts and the way too high deer tags. If we're going to get serious, let's take care of the unit. Otherwise, it's a, it's a wasted area. Thank you. Hey, we don't have any other comments from the audience. Uh comments from the rack. Yeah, uh, can I ask a clarifying question on that, uh, Brett, on uh, what you meant by the private land versus public land, your first comment? <clears throat> yeah, so in instances where there's cougar depredation happening, um, basically remove the language that says public lands. Um, I think it's a, is that a change to the proclamation this year? Stay here. Sure. The, the, the one complicating factor with this, uh, maybe I can summarize what, what I've heard at the other meetings. Um, the concern that the houndsmen have is we do have a, a, a an option, a biologist could issue a, a depredation tag to take a cougar that that's been causing chronic damage to livestock. So if, if they're seeing year after year uh, cougar damage and, and they haven't been able to, to catch the lion that they think's doing the damage, the division has the option to, to issue the, the landowner or the, the livestock producer a permit to, uh, to, to try to address after the sheep are gone, usually it's sheep, but after the livestock are off the mountain and, and wildlife services will help them while the sheep are there, but once the sheep leave, then then this gives them another option. I believe the houndsmen are concerned about that occurring on public land. Um, 
Did I summarize mm -hmm. that right? So the the important thing, I guess, for the discussion, I don't think Brett knew this, but um, that language comes straight from code. So that would be a legislative change that would be required to to make a change there. So never mind. <laughs> yeah, sorry, about that. I, didn't mean to, I didn't mean to blindside no, you there, but yeah, it makes that makes it tough. But uh, yeah, thanks. Yeah. Any other comments from the rack? I, I do have a question with the Beaver East. Um, why is that in predator management? I mean, is it is it? So this is. I talked, Mike Wardle's a biologist there, and, and he had a chance to, to talk to this last night. Um, obviously, any any units in predator management is director action, so so it's not an action item tonight, but, I, but you know, the discussion, I don't want to short circuit any discussion. And, and, but um, the concern there is the, is the second of the two scenarios that I mentioned. Um, you know, Brett's right, the, the issue there seems to be uh, a, environmental concern and um, we've seen a large decline below the objective for deer on that unit uh, we think it's drought related and so so our concern is that we're carrying we're continuing to carry a fairly high level of, of predators on a on a deer herd that that's in decline due to habitat loss or habitat concerns our hope is that once we see these conditions improve that that herd will have an opportunity to come back so the strategy there would be to reduce predator densities so that when that happens, that, that they can do that. That's why it was placed into predator management, just, just as information. So does that help? Yeah, but I guess as a clarification, because it is in predator management, we can't make that an action item and, and vote to have it removed. Right. I'm not asking for it to be removed. What, what we're asking for is that it not go Right. So, yeah, I mean, predator management plans by def definition are, are unlimited, but, uh, you know, I don't, I don't think that, that a discussion is off limits. I think the RAC could certainly discuss it. And if you've got concerns, you could pass those along to the board and the director will certainly uh, see those comments. But I also want to reemphasize, we really rely on our district biologists to, to give us recommendations regarding predator management plans. And one thing I strongly recommend is um, if people have concerns about some of these issues, get with those district biologists and sit down with them and, and work through uh, concerns because they're, they're the ones that are really in the driver's seat on, on whether a unit needs to be in predator management or not. We don't always put qualifying units in. We do take things into consideration and look at uh, historic harvest and, and what we're capable of and those kinds of things. So. I don't know if that helps at all, but hopefully. Any other comments? I have one comment. I was, I don't remember which Ooh. other RAC meeting it was. I think it might've been the Northeastern. The grad student who's conducting the study on the collar study was there. And he was asked the question as so to whether it would be, he would recommend that these lines not be taken that were, that have the collar on. And I don't know if he was just being politically correct or what, but he seemed indifferent. And so I don't know if you guys can elaborate on the importance of, you know, whether or not it's something that needs to be considered heavily, that those lines not be taken for, you know, to keep the integrity of the study, or if it's something that we don't need to worry about. Darren, do you have a comment on that? Or I guess that should have been during the question period. No, I think you're fine. I, so uh, just, just, Quick overview, that the study we're talking about tonight are on six units uh, in the central region. Um, and they're, they are looking at the, the reason that we're doing the study there is we're interested in looking at scavenging behavior um, by lions. Um, we've had a couple of studies. We've got the BYU study that's looking at the mule deer side. And we have a USU study looking at the lion side where, where they're looking at, they go to where they detect a cluster where a lion spent some time. They go look to see if it's if it's a kill site and what it, what it killed and ate at the site. And uh, one thing that's a little bit kind of a judgment call is, well, did it you know did it scavenge the animal or or did it kill it and eat it? And most of the time that's fairly clear, but there's a little bit of uh, doubt. And so we want to look at that question specifically. 
So the aim of the study, the primary aim of the study will be to get some lions on the air, um, but we also want to take uh, road killed deer up into those, these units and, and distribute them randomly and then just see see what kind of scavenging rates we get. Obviously, we can stratify based on whether a collared lion is in the area and how likely it is to encounter it. So, so those are the thoughts, it's still early stages. Um, the strategy we've employed so far with regards to collared animals is to uh, discourage people in our guidebooks from taking collared animals. And that that is because it, it takes a great deal of effort and cost um, to get to get collars on these animals. And when you lose the animal um, to a hunter, it can be, it can be frustrating. Um, lions in particular, sample sizes tend to be small, um, but, but again, our strategy has been to request that people don't. We, we have had collared lions taken by hunters um, on, on our USU lions. Um, typically what we try to do is, you know, recolor a different lion in order to get the date off that. It's not necessarily tied to an individual animal, but there's a lot of time and effort that goes into that. So maybe I'll just leave it at that. Could you tell us the difference between um, like discourage versus prohibit? Yeah, so a prohibited would, would carry a legal penalty. So um, if uh, if you took a collared lion where it was prohibited, then, then there'd be a citation issued and, and a person would would have to deal with that. Um, I can't answer what exactly, how that would rank in the criminal code or whatever. I'm sure, I just don't know the answer to that. But um, but there would be essentially a, a citation of some, law enforcement would be involved. Uh, where you, whereas right now, discouraging it, we kind of, well, you know, wish you hadn't done that kind of thing. So, yeah. I have a question, kind of follow up to that, Darren. How many of the collared lions are big toms? How many of them? Uh, so are uh, USU is looking at. I think they have one collared tom, um, but that's primarily a female study. They're they're looking at female survival and kitten survival, so they're interested in detecting uh, den sites and, and collaring kittens. And the object, there's several objectives, but one is to try to de develop a, a cougar population model. So, uh, so for that study, there haven't been a lot. Um, and I don't recall, I think the ones that have been killed with collars have all been females, and I, I could be wrong, but that's my recollection. Um, the, the, uh, the one that we're talking about in the central region would include toms. So I think the, the goal would be five toms. 30 total, total collars, so five toms and 25 females. And, and in this case, we're looking at cougar behavior, so we want to try to get both. Um, but uh, toms tend to range a little wider, and so females have a little smaller territory, so that we prioritize females. And they may be more likely to scavenge with kittens than, than, than a tom might be, who's, who's bigger and stronger and has a little bit more choice of what it, what it takes. So that's the thinking. Hey, Darren, we had one male collar on it. Oh, that's right. Should I say that for the record? Uh, guy, just, guy just mentioned there, we did have a male cat collared on the book cliffs that was taken by a hunter. Pr fairly quickly, too. It wasn't like a, a week later or seven days or something like that. Yeah. Any other comments from the rack? I have just one, and I'm probably a little off point, and maybe out of line, but I'm kind of miffed over why the legislature feels like they need to kind of overreach the management of the division. I think the division is highly educated and very qualified, and just a comment, but I wonder sometimes why the legislature has to be so involved. <laughs> Any other comments? So I, that came about, what, a, a year ago or a year and a half ago, I want to say. Um, it was a direct result of being way too late on their reaction to predator problems. So as I recall, anyway, I, someone can correct me if I'm wrong, but to take it through all the process and everything when there is an issue with predation, um, the only way they could do it in a quicker 
in a faster fashion was to make it put it into the director's hands. It does seem contrary to the North American model of wildlife conservation. Any other comments? I'll make one quick comment. I, I do think that, uh, and I, I know it's passed in, I, I, I believe it's passed in all the other racks, uh, the collared cats. I I know the, the amount of time and effort that goes into catching and putting those collars on, and, and it, it is important information. Um, so I, I think I, I could certainly support uh, the houndsman's recommendation to, uh, you know, ban, prohibit the taking of those collared cats uh, within the, the guidelines that they proposed. Uh, I think they were wise in their recommendation because they didn't include the spot and stock. That would be more difficult and also the uh, depredation or predator management areas. So I think that's something that uh, I, I think would be a good thing to see passed. What's the duration of the study? Just flashed a three, so is it yeah, three years? Yeah, but I, I need to say it on the mic. Yeah, we're, we're looking at probably a three-year uh, study. This is a master's level study, and, and the, the student who's working on it is, is one of our employees, one of our district biologists for the area. So. so essentially, if you were to make that motion, you would do it for the period of the study? Or just callers in general throughout the state? I, I guess as a clarification, what's the intent? Or the, once this study is done, are you planning to call her more, or is the, the caller going to go away? Uh, there's a potential to have callers on the air, you, you know, moving forward for for various reasons. So I think I think I don't want to speak for the houndsman, but I, I think what they're looking at is this particular study in this particular area, for the reasons they articulate. And if a collared lion was taken outside of that area, it would, it would not be a, a violation. And, and so, yeah, if we collared lions because we're, we're uh, we won't, for example, we have a, a nuisance animal that showed up in town. We want to monitor its movements and see what it does once we release it. Um, that would that'd be a possible reason we might put a collar on. Is there, can I, sorry, is there something in place that if we have a collared lion that is causing problems, is there a group that can come and move them? Yeah, well, typically if uh, if a lion's killing livestock, we don't want to move it. And so we'll uh, we'll work with the producers to, to remove that lion lethally. Yeah, so, and if it's got a collar, it's pretty easy to find. But, but um we have had collared lions get into sheep on, on the cache. And, and in those cases, we actually worked with the producers to leave those lions on the air and, and look at how many, how many uh, sheep were, were, the producer, were the producers finding and how many sheep were the lions actually killing because we were going in and, and detecting that. And, uh, and that's led to a, a new study uh, looking at the lamb side. So we got a little bit of interesting data out of that, and we're, we're kind of building on that in a little different way but uh we'll work with producers you work with your your local region and and uh you know if you've got losses wildlife services will also be in the mix so we'll work together but if yeah if a lion's taking sheep we we don't want to move it and, and create a problem for somebody else or cattle Anybody else uh, comments from the rack? If we're done with the comments from the rack, uh, we can entertain motions. Uh, I'll make a motion that uh, we accept the houndsman proposal for the collared cougar to be prohibited from being taken during the three-year study period on 
based on what their proposal was. Hey, Eric, before you get a second, would you mind considering on an, an amended motion or an, an addition to that? Um, I wonder if we could keep it to where it's it's still legal to harvest a collared animal within predator management areas. I was trying to look through their letter and see, I, I, Brett, can you, uh, does it? Yeah, it, so it was just intended to be, so if a unit went into predator management, that would be good to go to harvest a collared plant. Right, so that, that's the way their proposal is. It, it If it's in predator management, they can be taken. Um, correct? Yep. Yeah, so I, I felt like their proposal was pretty good. Is that? Yeah, that's that's what I'm. So yeah. I don't know that I need to amend that then because that that's covered. Okay. So I, have, I had a question about that too. Do we want to just do the certain time period, or I mean, a lot of times these graduate projects take an extra year or something. So um, do we want to add a couple years on the end of it? Because that would really mess up the study. Could you? If uh, that's what the study's going to go for, I, uh, and Darren mentioned that anything beyond that he didn't feel like was a big thing, so I, I'd, I'd like to just keep it during the, the study period. I would imagine that we'd have the opportunity to look at it again in three years as well. Yeah, I, I agree. If, if if for some reason the study went on or they started a new one, we'd have the opportunity in three years to make new motions, and so we could address that at that time. I'll second your motion. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Um, I, can I summarize your motion for everybody's clarification? Okay. Um, Eric Luke made a motion to accept or to adopt the Houndsman's Association pro proposal pursuant to collared lions and prohibiting the take of collared lions on units that are not in predator management and excluding spot and stock hunters for the duration of the study period to be revisited in three years. Is that correct? Okay, I, I hope I got all of it. And we have a second by Sunshine. Any discussion on the, the motion? Okay, there's no discussion on the motion. Those in favor? It looks like it's unanimous. Motion carries. Okay, that is the end of our agenda, save electing a new chair and vice chair, and we'll move to that point now. So we'll open the floor for nominations we, for chair. Mr. Chair, do we need to uh, make a recommendation on the remainder of the proposal? My, my bad, man. I'm trying to get home too fast tonight. I'm sorry, everybody. Uh, we, we do need now uh, entertain motions on the remainder of the division's recommendations. Thanks for the correction, Eric. Uh, I would like to make one other recommendation before we do that uh, regarding the Beaver East. Uh, I'd like to propose that the director look at the possibility um, of uh, making that a quota hunt that would satisfy the recommendations from the district biologists um, and, and also satisfy the recommendation from the houndsman. See if there's a compromise that can be made there. Is that a motion? That is a motion. Okay, we have a motion on the table. Do we have a second? 
I'll second it. Seconded by Darren. Would you restate your motion? <laughs> Sorry. De uh, Chris didn't get all Myself or Aaron didn't get it. We, we tried, but we got Okay, yeah. uh, make a motion to ask the director, since that is under his jurisdiction because it's in predator management, to look at possibility on the Beaver East unit of making that a quota unit that would still satisfy the uh, recommendations of the district biologists and also provides more opportunity and, and be in line with the Houndsman recommendation. And you still want to second that? Yes. Okay, the motion, we got the motion now, Chris. Okay, and seconded by Darren. Any discussion on the motion? No discussion, uh, all in favor? We have 10 in favor, any opposed? We have one opposed. Motion carries. Hey, do we have any other motions on the, the Cougar recommendations? Just a quick question. So then does that cover the recommendations of the division in its entirety? <laughs> it can. The, okay. the, you can you can make a motion however you like on that. Do we need another one or are we good? We do. We need a motion so for the remainder. Well, I'll move that we accept the rest of the uh, division's recommendations. We have a motion on the floor, a second. I can second, Dana. Okay, it sounds like Dana seconded it. Yes. Any discussion? If there's no discussion, all in favor? Looks like it's unanimous, motion carries. Okay, now That's we're done. Yeah, we're done. Now we're done. The chairman. There's no. We, we do. Yeah, what we're going to do before we open the floor for nominations for the chair and vice chair, Chris is going to go over the requirements and the duties that you're going to have. Yeah, so we need a chairman and a vice chair, a chairperson, I should say, chairperson and a vice chairperson. Um, Trish Hedin was our last chairperson, and she served for several years. Um, the, the main responsibility is to run this meeting, and then also this person also um, goes to our salt to our board meeting in Salt Lake City and represents the RAC, sits up towards the front in front of the board and reports to the RAC or to the wildlife board what our RAC has voted on and some of the discussions that have happened. Um, it requires the person to be able to go to these board meetings, which is, there's six of them every year. Um, they take place on a Thursday at nine o'clock in downtown Salt Lake City, so, um, or near downtown. So it's, it's, it's a drive there and a drive back and sometimes it's a, five, six, seven, eight hour meeting. Um, so it's quite the commitment. It's a volunteer position, of course, as all of you are volunteers and serving. Um, so that, that should, you should remember that. I guess also um, we do reimburse mileage, of course, like we do for t tonight's meetings and, and all RAC meetings, we reimburse mileage for wildlife board meetings. And if you live far enough away, which most of you do, and you wanna go up the night before, we reimburse for hotel and, and meals as well. So, um, yeah, and I guess in the event that the chairman, chairperson can't make it, um, the vice chair hopefully can fill in during those times. And if those two people can't make it, then I can fill in sometimes too, but that's not ideal. So um, I've asked how we go about doing this, and there's a few ways we can do this tonight. You can nominate somebody, and if that person accepts your nomination, um, they become a candidate. If there's only one candidate, we could make a motion to accept that person. If there's more than one candidate, um, I have some secret ballot um, papers here we can vote on. So I'm up for however it turns out. So, yeah. Okay. And then one thing that, that Chris brought up earlier, those that are attending virtually, 
you can send Chris Wood a text if we're voting on multiple candidates via secret ballot. You can just send Chris a text. So you guys do have Chris's number, right? We'll put it in the chat. Okay, yeah. They're going to put uh, Chris's number in the chat to you guys real quick just to make sure. Okay, so with that, I guess we can open the floor for nominations for the chair. I'll make a nomination and nominate Kent Johnson. Thank you for the motion. I'll accept the nomination. Any other nominations? Any other nominations for the chair? I, I would like to nominate Scoot Flannery. I don't know if he has the time or his schedule, but he can decline if he wants. Did you decline or accept? Okay. Any other nominations? I didn't hear what you said, Scoot. What was your excuse? <laughs> okay, gotcha, gotcha, okay. <laughs> well, if there's no other nominations, um, I guess we can accept, we can entertain a vote or we can entertain a motion to accept by acclamation. Can I ask, can I ask a question? So yeah. in that role, I guess I would say I appreciated um, Kent's um, contributions, you know, being on the rack and hearing what you've had to say. And so that's going to be somewhat limited, right? In terms of your own, as the facilitator, you're somewhat limited with that. Is that right? Am I? Uh, negative. I can make comments and speak all I want. Chris, I'll, am I going to why Steve you know voted me? In the you event to show me up. Up. <laughs> maybe, maybe Kevin can give us a better insight because he's on the board and he's, are you the, ch are you the chairman of the board now? So, Kevin, what is the rule of a, a chair, chairperson? Can they add their opinion and, 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 and participate that way, you think? Yeah, absolutely. They're encouraged to, to give their opinion. Um, they're, to make a motion um, is um, rare. Um, they, they, I have seen them make a motion, but it, it's not often. Um, but, but mostly what they're, they're there for um, in a voting status is to break a tie. Um, and, and so um, a lot of times th those are times that are very heated um, and, and valued. And so some, sometimes those are positions that aren't very fun to be in, but, um, but they're asked, they're needed. So. Um, I, I would just say a couple things since I since I stepped up. We've got some new um, RAC members, um, so your your input is very valued, um, and we certainly appreciate the time that you put in. Um, I think there's 15 or 16 of, 16 of you on the RAC, and 15, um, and many times it's it's when you do 15 times five, there's a lot of opinions that come to the board and it's hard to address all of those. And, and I can say that in no way will, will the board ever be able to address each of you. But if you ever have any questions, please reach out to the board in a phone call. Be glad to, to talk to, to any of you and, and hope that we take, um, you know, especially your chairman, take take all of that input here and, and um, give it to the wildlife board. And so we, we, very much value that. I should have introduced Kevin. So Kevin Albrecht is um, a wildlife board member who represents the southeastern region. That doesn't mean he he he'll you know vote every way this this rack votes, but he's here for you guys to talk to and discuss things with, and um, he listens. So and he also served as a rack member for eight years and was the the chairman of the rack for a lot of years too. So. I'll be a witness to that. He's been very responsive when I've reached out to him on certain issues. Appreciate it. Can I make a motion? I move that we suspend the rules and put Ken in by acclamation. Do we have a motion on the floor? Do we have a second? I'll second. Kirk? Lynn. Or Lynn. 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 Okay. Have but I would too, so. 
<laughs> I have a motion and a second. All in favor? Looks unanimous. Motion carries. We need to vote on a vice chair now. Okay. Vice vice chair. Okay, we'll now open the floor for nominations for vice chair on the rack. I move that we nominate Scoot for the vice chairman. I'd second that. Any other nominations? I'll accept that. So I know that Canton's going to step up. <laughs> I'm throwing you the wolves, dude. <laughs> Any other nominations? There are no other nominations, same as before. We can vote on it or we can have a motion to accept by acclamation. I'll make that motion to accept you by acclamation. And I'll second it this time. Lynn and Kirk. Lynn and a second by Kirk to accept by acclamation. All in favor? It is unanimous. Motion carries. Congratulations, Scoop. All right. Can I get more announcement? Uh, Chris needs one more announcement. Sorry. Uh, hopefully, you've all been receiving emails from Stacey Coons. She's our RAC and, and board chairperson, a coordinator at our Salt Lake office. There is a rack and board training on August 25th. It's at our Farmington Bay Wildlife Education Center. Um, hopefully a lot of you can go. There, there is a virtual option or attending in-person option. So um, even if you only make part of the virtual option, I encourage you to, to go. If you're gonna be there in person, again, if you need to go the night before, um, we'll reimburse you for hotel and for food um, and mileage, of course. So just let me know and I'll get you a form when, when I see you up there, but um, you can stay in any hotel you want. It's a stay within the state rate, which is a hundred dollars a night plus tax. So um, can't stay at Grand America, but you can probably stay somewhere, you know, up near Farmington somewhere. But anyways, or anywhere along the way, we'll reimburse you. But hopefully a lot of you can attend that. I think it's very valuable. You'll hear um, presentations from our biologists about big game management and how we come up with recommendations. And you'll hear from our attorney general reps who will talk about the laws of wildlife and what it means to be a, a public volunteer and conflict of interest and things like that. So it's it's a very valuable annual training we do. So I hope you can make it. Absolutely. Yeah, it's actually a pretty good deal. I've went. It's a good deal. You learn a lot. Okay, um, I guess that concludes our business. I would entertain a motion to adjourn. Darren moved to adjourn. Do we have a second? No, no. Nope. Adjourn. Yep, I second it. <laughs> oh, okay. All right. We are adjourned.